Um, let's continue. Uh, hello, Jerry. <laughs> so uh, <coughs> now we're going to have a look at the uh, Vitaka Santana Sutta, uh, the uh, removal of the uh, thoughts. Yeah, the distracting is not actually found in the. I'm not sure why it is called distracting because it's not found in the Pali. Vitaka means thought, Santana means to calm, and Sutta means Sutta. So it means a calming of thoughts, really. So someone has added distracting there just to distract us. So <laughs> this is on page 47. Huh? And uh, just to uh, remind you, this morning we were looking at the uh, Avidja Sutta, the Ignorance Sutta, which shows how starting out from uh, reading the word of the Buddha, listening to the Buddha, <coughs> understanding what the Dhamma is about, going via faith, going via all these various practices, you end up with vijja, you end up with knowledge and understanding. Yeah? And at that point, uh, you have overturned the avijja at the root of dependent origination. Uh, so then, <coughs> uh, dependent origination goes into dependent cessation, because avijja has ceased, uh, then each of the factors of dependent origination ceases in turn. Yeah? Each one kind of coming to an end as a consequence. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is w so this is why that is so important. What we were doing, talking about this morning, the whole thing comes to an end, and the cessation of suffering as a consequence. So when you have vidya, you no longer think that there is any happiness to be pursued. Yeah, because you realize that that happiness comes from ceasing. Yeah, ceasing just happens by sitting down and being quiet. You don't pursue cessation. You have already reached a point. Things will cease by themselves in due course. There's nothing more to be done. So you don't pursue anything. You don't pursue happiness in the world. You don't look for things out there at all. Uh, you are just quiet. Uh, and the best happiness you can have is to allow all your will and all that stuff just to die down. Uh, and uh, for that reason, sankharas come to a stop. Uh, you're no longer willing, pursuing happiness. That will has ended. Uh, and because there is no interest in the world anymore, uh, but your consciousness is no longer stationed anywhere. Yeah, I remember the, we were talking about the stations of consciousness before, and it's like, what is your interest? Uh, yeah, where is your what is the interest of your mind? Okay, my interest is in peace and quiet, in high states of samadhi, or my interest is in the material realm. But actually, there's no interest at all anymore. So imagine where your consciousness is at when there's no interest in anything. You're completely released from the idea of being interested in, in the world in that sense. That is what non-attachment means, yeah? Having no interest, no inclination of the mind. The consciousness it doesn't go there anymore. The mind is released from this idea of being interested in anything here. Yeah. So when you come to your deathbed, uh, there is no match for consciousness. The consciousness doesn't kind of, there's, there's no level that it kind of matches to where it can get reborn, because it doesn't have any interest in any of that. Uh. So instead of consciousness then continuing and propelling itself into the future, it just stops right there. Uh. It doesn't go on. Uh. That is the end of consciousness. Yeah. So then because consciousness comes to an end, of course all the rest also doesn't happen. There's no nama rupa. There cannot be any mental qualities without consciousness because you can't experience them. If you can't experience the mental qualities, well, you're not going to have any sense bases. You're not going to have any contact because that requires all of these mental things. You're not going to have any feelings. You're not going to have any craving. If there's no feelings, you can't crave. If you don't crave, there's nothing to take up. There's no existence again, no jati, everything just falls apart. And then that's the end of suffering here. Yeah. So that's how that third noble truth kind of, uh, that's very brief because I'm not going to go into too much detail. I think we've talked enough about dependent origination. But um, uh, what of course is important in all of this now is to talk more about the path. Yeah? And in particular, I mentioned, we are talking about before, about the link between Vedana and Tanha, uh, between feelings and craving. Uh, how can we reduce the craving that often comes as a result of feelings? Uh, that is one of the big questions. Uh, because the more we reduce that craving, uh, then uh, the, uh, we are reducing one of the big problems on the path, 
Yeah, we are purifying the mind, we are uh, building up the Noble Eightfold Path, the right effort and all of that. Uh, and as we are reducing the craving, there comes a point when we will be able to enter Samadhi and undermine the avidja at the very beginning. So this is a very important part, learning to uh, deal with the feelings of the world without acting, acting them out in craving. Uh, and this is what is coming up now. Uh, and this is in large part equivalent to the sixth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah, Samapadana, right effort. Uh, and uh, it is equivalent to many of the things we saw this morning, uh, Sati Sampajanya, sense restraint and all of that is all part of this. This is how you really do sense restraint. Uh, yeah, this is what this is about. This is the kind of the real practice behind sense restraint. So, uh, let us see now how this is done. Uh, the removal of thoughts is this particular sutta. Uh, Majjhima Nikaya, middle length saying is number 20. Thus have I heard, page 47 in your little booklet, uh, page 47. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anattapindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, or maybe mendicants, as Ajahn Sudhartha would have it, when a mendicant is pursuing the higher mind, from time to time they should give attention to five signs or five things. What are the five? So, uh, pursuing the higher mind, what is the higher mind? The higher mind, adhichitta, that's right, yeah? And the adhichitta is uh, basically the four jhanas. So you are pursuing samadhi, you're trying to attain samadhi, you want to move towards samadhi. You're not trying in a stupid way by craving too much, but you're cr trying in the wise way. This is the wise way on how to attain samadhi. Huh? And to do that, to attain this high mind, you have to give attention to five nimittas. Nimittas here just means five. Nimitta usually means like a sign, but uh, in this case it's more like five methods of overcoming the, uh, the, the uh, bad qualities of the mind. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit strange that it uses the word sign here. I'm not sure why, because usually the word nimitta doesn't, is not used in this way. This is quite a specialized way. But um, it, it means something like five ways. It's th in other words, this sutta is about five different ways of overcoming unwholesome mental states. Yeah? So very useful, very, very practical sutta. So what are these five? Here, bhikkhus, uh, when a bhikkhu is giving attention, or a bhikkhuni, or a upasaka, upasaka is giving attention to some sign, now the word sign makes more sense, yeah, you are uh, uh, attending to a particular theme or thing, and owing to that sign there arises in him bad, unwholesome qualities uh, connected with desire, uh, with ill will, and with confusion. Uh, <coughs> then he should give attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome. When he gives attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome, then any bad, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, ill will or confusion are abandoned in him and subside. When with the abandoning of them, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness, and stilled. Let's just stop there for a, a minute. So here, when you are giving attention to some sign, yeah, because of that sign, you get some defilement arising. This is what is he called evil. I don't like the word evil. It's kind of strange, but bad, unwholesome thoughts. Uh, and again, you have the three root problems, desire, ill will, and confusion is a better way of translating it. So, because you are giving attention to this particular thing, these defilements arise. Yeah? And then, what you should do is give attention to something else, to some other sign connected with what is wholesome, doesn't have these negative qualities. Uh, and this can happen in meditation, 
It can happen outside of meditation, yeah, any time. Here, the emphasis is probably on meditation practice because you are devoted to the higher mind, so you're trying to achieve a samadhi state. So the emphasis is on meditation and practice. But this is a practice you can do at any time, yeah? If you have enough awareness and mindfulness, then this method is useful. Yeah? It's difficult to have enough mindfulness to do this consistently, but uh, uh, you can to some extent. Uh, so, <coughs> let's say that you are meditating, you are attending on the breath or something, and then some thought or something arises. And that thought uh, can very easily be a thought connected with desire or maybe with ill will, depending on what it is. Uh, yeah? This happens sometimes when you meditate. Sometimes it happens often when you meditate. It really depends on the situation. So, uh, what do you do? And there's two things you can do. He says here that you attend to some other sign, yeah, uh, that can mean two different things. It can mean either that you shift your attention away from that object. So say that you are watching the breath, for example, yeah, and then you lose the breath and you think about something which irritates you. It can mean that you put your attention back on the breath. Because that breath doesn't have, doesn't give rise to ill will and greed. Yeah, it's other things that give rise to ill will and greed. So you just put your back on the breath again, and then you overcome that particular ill will as a consequence. But uh, or it can mean that you uh, sometimes you need to do more than that because just putting it back on the breath is not going to be sufficient, especially if uh, it becomes a strong thought, a strong emotion. Uh, often what you have to do is you have to think of another object, uh, which is the opposite of that object. So say that you are uh, a person arises in your mind, yeah, and you have ill will towards them, okay, you can substitute for another person uh, who you don't have ill will towards. Uh, yeah, that is then a possibility. You just think about something else. You move your, your mind in a different area. But the best way of dealing with this, and this is the way which really overcomes the problem, and this is the ideal way, uh, is to not to change the object. Uh, changing the sign here doesn't mean that the object is changed. Uh, it can mean that the way you look at the object is changed. Uh, this is the most powerful way. Uh, so if you see someone who gives rise, especially ill will and anger, this is the biggest problem, someone who gives <coughs> rise to this, you have to learn to think about that person in a different way. Yeah? That is the critical thing. Yeah? So, and I've spoken about this before, and the way to do that is if uh, you have ill, and we'll have a look at this later on anyway, if you then have ill will to somebody, uh, is to remember that actually it is not personal. Uh, if they have done something bad to you, it's never personal. Uh, they do things because of their own conditioning, uh, because of their own weaknesses, uh, uh, because they are creating suffering for themselves. And the more you think about it in that way, that it's not personal, it's their problem, you can actually shift from ill will to compassion. And you can do it often in the blink of an eye, just like that, uh, if you build up this perception very strongly. Uh, anyone who behave stupidly is worthy of compassion in this world uh, because they have no idea that they're undermining their own life. But that is what they are doing here. Yeah. So very, uh, very useful way of reflecting. And it is incredibly powerful. If you can do that, shift your perception of that person, then the problem is completely gone. Uh, yeah? It will not re-arise again. With the other two methods as I s was suggesting before, going back to the breath or looking at another person, it will still be there in the background. Uh, it will easily re-arise. Uh, but if you want to really obliterate it, and this is uh, one of the words used in the suttas, uh, anabhavangameti, make it go to non-existence, it's like obliterating something, you have to use wisdom power. Wisdom power is the only way that can obliterate and eliminate these things uh, very, very strongly. Yeah. So you look at that person in a new way, that is the critical thing. Yeah. And to be able to look at that person in a different way, you have to train your mind to look at people in a new way. It's not going to happen just like that. So you have to learn, take someone, someone in your life who you find difficult, uh, and train yourself to see that person in a new light. Uh, see them as a victim of their own conditioning, uh, a victim of their own past, uh, a victim of their own past lives, uh, as someone who has to be this way, even though they probably don't want to be bad. Yeah. And as you do that, you are, re, you are making it possible for you to have compassion 
even for people who are very difficult. Uh, this is really the trick here. Yeah? So um, uh, then, when you have built up that perception in this way, then in your meditation the negative sign, the negative perception arises, you substitute for the positive perception, you remember that positive view, you bring that in, and straight away the ill will is just flattened out, it's gone. Uh, it's almost like magic, but it's not magic, it's just a very powerful way of using perception to overcome defilements of the mind. Uh, and this works, yeah? this is kind of the, 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 the it, this is uh, uh, kind of the way that the Buddha is kind of explaining things here. Yeah. It is, uh, and remember, this is the first of the five techniques, uh, and because it is the first one, it is the most powerful one. Uh, this is the one we should ideally use uh, in daily life and also in our meditation practice to overcome uh, unwholesome thoughts. Uh. So that is the ill will. The ill will is by far the easiest one to overcome. Yeah, it is the one which really is a. Uh, it, it, it takes training, but it doesn't take that much training to overcome thoughts of ill will. Uh, thoughts of desire, more difficult to overcome. Uh, yeah, because they seem nice, uh, they don't seem so dangerous, uh, and it's more difficult to remember the negative aspects of it. Uh, uh, but uh, you can do that as well, especially if you know a little bit, you have some meditation experience, and some of you have had some very good meditation experiences, and that's, that's wonderful, so you know what is possible, uh, that something higher is possible. Uh, and because you know that, uh, then you can also know that this greed, this desire, gets in the way of those higher experiences. And then you understand the danger in those things, and then you can move away, and you can let them go as well. Uh. Yeah, so you understand the danger in the other thought, you move on to a different perception that you have built up over time. Uh, this is what is meant by this. Uh, you shift your attention to a different thing, uh, connected with what is wholesome. Uh, once you understand what is going on, it's actually very simple. Uh, it's not when, if you read it by yourself, it may not be obvious exactly what you're supposed to do, but once you get it, actually it's very straightforward. Uh, and you can do this in your daily life, yeah? when you meet people or whatever. Uh, this is exactly the sort of thing you can do. Uh. So then that subsides, yeah? the, th the bad thought subsides. Uh, and uh, when the bad thoughts subsides, uh, then uh, that is where the samadhi becomes possible. So when all the bad thoughts are eliminated, uh, the delusion thought is a bit more difficult, or the confusion thoughts. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. This one, uh, okay, just now you have my mind. Just now related to the statement, okay, uh, say in the meditation, uh, we are using our anapanasati, yeah. and then later on, you see somebody, and then you get anger arise. Mm. So, shift because the anger, whatever it is, the working of sankara is the is the thought. Yeah. Okay, just shift the know the feeling, the feeling of of evil. So you take the evil as object. Mm. Then, yeah. when you because you know the feeling, you are no you use a knowing mind already. Yeah. You know already. Then it disappeared. Can do. Uh, can, can do sometimes. <laughs> because, yeah. Because uh, you see, yeah. it change. Yeah. Change the uh, shift. Yeah. You shift yeah. the the, yeah. the sign or. Can do that, yeah. and uh, actually later on there comes a similar method. Comes later. Remember, there's five methods. This is only the first method. So there's other methods come later on. So that what you're saying can work, but this is the most powerful one here. Because if you take the feeling as the object, and then you don't focus on the ill will, and then it dissipates, sometimes it's not, it hasn't been overcome in a strong way. Yeah? It's a weak way of overcoming it, and it will be very easily re arise again afterwards. That's the problem with that method. Yeah? But if you use this method, you overcome it in a very strong way, and it won't re arise again. Yeah? In fact, this method here, instead of having ill will, would make you have metta or compassion to the person. Yeah? Yeah? So it's almost the exact opposite feeling here. Yeah? And then the ill will is really completely gone. So what you're saying is not wrong, uh, it is true, but uh, 
uh, these are just additional ways of dealing with the issue. You get five different ways here, yeah? So you can choose your favorite, uh, your favorite way here. But the mo first one is the most powerful one. That's why it comes first. Uh, yeah. So <coughs> it subsides. And because here it subsides really deeply, uh, yeah, I, I was just talking about confusion, and it is more difficult to deal with confusion. Uh, but you, you know, you just have to be. Sometimes you just have to wait for the confusion to dissipate, I suppose, or you have to take your mind away from an object, maybe a fantasy or something, which is kind of deluded, or you are enjoying the sloth or whatever, something like that, and take your mind away from that. And then as you do that, you can come out of the delusion as well. Although that is more, can be a bit more tricky. Yeah. But if you understand what is going on, you can, you can do that as well. Yeah. And then, because you are doing this in a very deep way, overcoming them really in a profound sense, then you actually can enter samadhi quickly afterwards. Uh, so here we're dealing with fairly refined thoughts, not very strong thoughts of greed and desire, but fairly refined. Uh, yeah? And then, because of that, your mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness, and, and stilled. And this is really just another way of saying that you attain samadhi, you attain the jhana states. This is what this is about. Uh, the, uh, these are just different ways of talking about jhanas, steadied internally, yeah? S the mind is very steady, very peaceful, quieted down, brought to singleness is only one point of focus, uh, and of course concentrated or stilled again, the last one. Uh. And then we have um, a simile to explain what is going on. Uh. Just as a skilled carpenter or his apprentice might knock out, remove, uh, or extract a coarse peg by means of a fine one. So too, the bhikkhu uses this method. Uh, and when he gives attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome, uh, his mind then achieves this samadhi. Uh. So the peg here is like a thought, uh, yeah? Like a thought or a perception. So you have a coarse peg, which is the unwholesome thought. Uh, and then you use a fine, a, a, a positive thought, which is like the fine peg. Uh, a beautiful, wholesome thought of kindness or whatever, you use that to uh, take out the bad one. Uh. So you see there's a stage wise, there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of a stage, one stage after the other, and you have to get the stages right. Uh. So you start with the getting rid of the unwholesome thought, moving to the wholesome thought, and then from the wholesome thought uh, to quieting down the mind. Uh. You don't quieten down the mind when the wholesome thought is there. Because sometimes if, sorry, you don't quiet down the mind when the unwholesome thought is there. Because if you do that, all you do is often suppressing the unwholesome thought. And it kind of underlies and it's kind of there. And it does, is not really properly overcome. And sometimes people who have very strong defilements, yeah, and they suppress it a lot, it actually sometimes even leads to mental problems. And there are examples of people going on meditation retreats who have psychosis because instead of actually dealing with these things properly, uh, they suppress them and they don't really know what they're doing and then it ends up in a negative way as a consequence. Uh, so you have to have a certain mental stability to start out. People who are mentally unstable often uh, they have to be more careful with how they deal with uh, meditation practice. Uh. So this is the first way, it's called the substitution way, yeah? where you use perception. Uh, and I'll show you in more detail later on how this is done as we go through this. Uh. Let's go to the second way here. <coughs> so if while he is giving attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome, there still arise in him evil, unwholesome thoughts uh, connected with desire, with ill will, and with confusion. Uh, then he should examine the danger in those thoughts thus. Uh, these thoughts are unwholesome, they are reprehensible, they result in suffering. Uh, when he examines the danger in those thoughts, uh, then any Bad, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, ill will, and confusion are abandoned in him and subside. With the abandoning of them, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness, and stilled. 
So if the first method does not succeed, then you go to the second method. So the first method should always be given priority. It is the most important one. This is what he's saying here, yeah? Because this one is comes if this still arises. In other words, this is a secondary method. So if that doesn't work, you have to try some medicine which is stronger. And this stronger medicine is to remember the danger in these things. So if you have reflected a lot on the danger in anger, uh, yeah, how it leads to your problems for yourself and problems for others, uh, how it never really resolves the issues, uh, how it leads to revenge in circles uh, and things just going round and round, this anger is pointless. Yeah, it doesn't actually solve anything usually. Uh, uh, actually, it never really does, especially long term. There's no solution, although you can maybe calm things a bit in the short term. Long term, anger is no solution. Uh, and then, because you remember that, you just let it go. Uh, and uh, same thing with, um, with desire. Yeah, You understand that the desire for the world also is useless. It, all it does is drives you away from your meditation practice. Uh, makes your mind clouded and tired because you use up all your energy in thinking about these things. Uh, but actually, it is only problematic and doesn't lead to anything positive, any good outcomes. Uh, so you, again, you let it go for the same reason. Uh, and there is uh, this sutta which comes just before this one, which I often also read out on retreats. It's called the Dveda Vitakis, Vitaka Sutta, the two <coughs> kinds of thoughts. Uh, and there, the Buddha actually teaches this technique. This is actually the Buddha practicing this technique rather when he, before his own awakening, yeah, he actually says this is what I did when I was practicing for awakening. So obviously he's encouraging us to follow his footsteps. And what he says is that when I remembered the danger in these thoughts for myself, for others, for both, then they disappear just like that. Yeah, because you really understand the danger is in these things. Uh, they never lead to anything positive in the long run. They always lead to problems. Uh, but to get that again, you have to contemplate it. Yeah, why is the anger? And sometimes it's so attractive. You want to get, you want to be angry because it gives you a sense of power. Sometimes being angry. Yeah, you get things done. People li listen to you when you're a bit upset. Uh, if you say things gently, people may not listen to you. Uh, but actually, they may listen. But in the you know, th th they may become very quiet straight away because it's unpleasant to deal with an angry person, but are they really listening? Probably not. Uh, and, uh, but if you are gentle, usually it, it bears much better results, especially in the long run, than if you are angry. So you understand these issues, uh, how one leads to trouble, one does not. Uh, how one is uh, beneficial, what the other one is not. And then uh, you can overcome these kind of thoughts that way. Uh. So this is one thing the Buddha says, and then he says that uh, uh, these defilements, they make wisdom cease, panya nirodika, so, so wisdom ceases when you have these defilements in the mind. Yeah, wisdom ceases because you are uh, swayed by these defilements. These defilements distort your perception of reality. You can't see clearly as long as you have defilements in the mind. And that lack of clarity, that being biased in a certain way, that is precisely a lack of wisdom. You're no longer able to take good decisions because of that. And that is the problem. Wisdom has disappeared. So if you want to be wise, and everybody usually wants to be wise, then these things are really bad news. Then they are concerned with suffering. Yeah, all of these defilements are concerned with suffering, with craving, with being dissatisfied, and all of this. And finally, they lead away from nibbana. Nibbana just means they lead away from being cool. Yeah, being kind of have an even mind and all of that. That's kind of the initial stages of nibbana, if you like, being really having a cool heart. And all of these things are really bad. And the Buddha says, as soon as he reflected in that way, his mind, bang, left, left those defilements behind. And then he went into the jhana states. Uh, that is how that sutta describes the Buddha's own journey for doing with this. And this is what we're seeing here. Similar kind of thing. Uh, you remember the risk, the danger in these negative thoughts. Uh, and as you remember that, uh, you move your mind away from them. Huh? <coughs> So again, you can see it is not, it's not difficult to do, 
The only thing that is difficult is that you have to really know how to think in such a way that it actually works. That is the hard part. Uh, and to be able to do that, you have to try it many times uh, and try to use it in everyday situations. Keep on reminding yourself of the danger of these things. And as you do, this becomes a reality and you can use those ideas. It's like ideas and perceptions you have in your mind. Yeah, they're ready to be used at any time. And then you employ them when they are required in this kind of situation. So you build up these perceptions. So. And then the unwholesome thought goes and you go into samadhi. And then you have the uh, this powerful simile here. Just as a woman or a man, a woman actually comes first in the Pali, young, youthful and fond of ornaments would be horrified, humiliated and disgusted if the carcass of a snake or a dog or a human being were hung around his or her neck. It's a powerful simile, isn't it? What do you think about having a carcass of a snake hung around your neck? Would you be happy? Or one of these mangy dogs running around, hanging around your neck? <laughs> it would be terrible. It would be sm a carcass like an, you know, a dead corpse hanging around you. That is how the Buddha compares that to these thoughts. That's what these thoughts are like. They are that dangerous, that disgusting. <coughs> this is how the Buddha compares unwholesome thoughts. Most of us, we kind of indulge in these unwholesome thoughts. Uh, and the Buddha says, like having a c dead dog hanging around your neck. Yeah? That's what it really means. Uh, so do you want, is that what you want? Dead dogs hanging around your neck? Yeah? Don't think so. It doesn't, doesn't sound very attractive. So this is how bad these things actually are. It gives us some f idea of how we should, how how repelled we should be by these thoughts. We should really be repelled by them, because that's how terrible they are from the uh, enlightened point of view. Yeah? They are com utterly useless. We are indulging in things that only lead to suffering, only lead to problems. And yet somehow we don't get that. We think that there's something positive in there. It shows you how distorted our outlook is from the enlightened point of view. What the Aryans say is suffering, we say is happiness. Yay! It's a complete opposite, yeah? it's a complete reversal of reality here. And this is what makes, again, makes the Dhamma so interesting, profound and interesting at the same time. Yeah? So that is the way to think about that. Yeah? And then when you understand how repulsive these thoughts really are, it is not hard to give up. Yeah? It's very easy to give up. You remove your hand from that hot plate, you don't hold on to it, and then bang, you go into samadhi. Boom! Samadhi, jhanas happens very quickly when we get it right uh, in this way. That's the idea here. Huh? <coughs> so, let's go to the third one. Huh? So remember these come in sequence, yeah, one after the other, one more powerful than the initial ones being the most powerful ones. Uh. If while he is examining the danger in those thoughts, uh, there still arise in him bad and wholesome thoughts connected with desire, with ill will and with confusion. Then he should try to forget those thoughts and should not give attention to them. When he tries to forget those thoughts and does not give attention to them, then any evil, bad and wholesome thoughts connected with desire and with ill will and with delusion are abandoned in him and subside. Then with the abandoning of them, his mind becomes steadied, internally quieted, brought to singleness and stilled. Yeah, so you don't pay any attention to them. So, uh, for example, if you are uh, kind of doing anapanasati, uh, and then these thoughts start to intrude in your anapanasati, you just stay with the breath, yeah? You don't pay any attention to the thoughts, you kind of let them, you don't, you don't really do anything with them, you just leave them in the background and eventually, if you are lucky, they will just die out by themselves. And that is a bit like the method you were explaining before, yeah? Instead of going with the ill will, you f go to the feeling instead and you don't pay attention to the ill will, you pay attention to the feeling. And when you stay with a feeling like that, sometimes the ill will will just disappear. And also you will learn something about the 
unpleasantness of ill will, yeah, because that feeling is not nice. When you have ill will, you become a bit more tight, you become a bit more, uh, there's something uh, about it which isn't nice. Metta, you're really relaxed and open, there's a narrowness of mind and a problem in the mind when you have, when you have the ill will. And you learn something about the difference in feeling there at the same time, which is very useful. Huh? So here you just forget about it, yeah, you stay with your meditation object, leave it in the background, uh, yeah, and sometimes that works, and then it just disappears by itself eventually, because uh, whatever, the, the, the force of the thought wears itself out, it only has so much momentum or whatever, and eventually it wears itself out. Uh, so you can do that, you don't pay any attention to it. Uh, but remember, this is the third way, yeah? So this is much weaker. And the reason why it is weaker is because you're not doing anything active to overcome that thought. Uh, you're just allowing it to be. Uh, you haven't really overturned it, you haven't really eliminated that perception. And it can then therefore re-arise again very quickly as a consequence. Uh, the first two methods, the reason why they are so powerful, is because you're actively overturning the perception huh? and actively learning to look at the world in a new way. Huh? That is really, really powerful, huh? because there you are undermining your whole tendency to ill will huh? and really destroying that tendency at a very deep level. Here, you're more setting it aside, setting it aside temporarily. Huh? It doesn't have the same kind of power for that reason. Huh? So, just as a man with good eyes, uh, who did not want to see forms, yeah, that had come within the range of sight, would either shut his eyes uh, or look away. Yeah, look away means you go back to the breath, uh, shut your eyes, I'm not sure what that means, it probably means, uh, I don't know, that, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but l certainly looking away is the obvious one, yeah, you go back to the breath and stay with the breath. Uh, then the bhikkhu tries to forget those thoughts uh, and does not give attention to them. Uh, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness and stilled. So uh, sometimes if you become very peaceful and you don't want to do too much in your meditation, you don't want to think or use any perceptions or whatever, uh, sometimes this can be a useful way. If it's a very weak thought that arises, you just kind of move your attention back and doesn't really have much effect, uh, then uh, you can try these kind of techniques. Uh, so just, uh, it's a matter of uh, time and place, and you have to experiment a little bit what works best, but always remember the first ones are the most powerful ones. Uh, <coughs> now we come to the fourth one. Uh, if while he is trying to forget those thoughts uh, and is not giving attention to them, there still arise in him bad, unwholesome thoughts uh, connected with desire, with ill will and with confusion, uh, then he should give attention to the stilling of the thought formation of those thoughts. Uh, when he gives stilling to the thought formation of those thoughts, uh, then any bad, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire <coughs> with hate and with, with <coughs> ill will rather, with confusion, are abandoned and subside in him. And with the abandoning of them, his mind becomes then, goes to samadhi. Yeah, so uh, this one is a bit more cryptic. Yeah. And the Pali here is vitakka sankara santana, the stilling of the f thought formation. And so the formation here is the, uh, what he Vikibodhi translates as, a, tra is his translation for Sankara. So Sankara is again the creative force, yeah? This is what we talked about before, Sankara is all about creation. Uh, so what you are stilling here, you are stilling the creative force uh, that makes that thought come into existence. That force is being stilled down, uh, yeah? This is the purpose point of this. Uh, so giving attention to the stilling of the thought formation. Uh, in other words, you're no longer put adding fuel to the fire. Uh, you're allowing the fire to go down. The fire is always that intention, yeah, the, uh, the, cre the creation of these things. Uh, the, uh, you're actually interested in that object. You're in, you, want to, you want to see it. You have some kind of intention to have ill will almost. Uh, and that is what is kind of creating this. Uh, so here, what you're doing instead of actually being engaged with the object, instead of creating it, uh, you are standing back from it. Uh, 
and this is really a way of using mindfulness uh, yeah to stop you from uh, creating more of that negative emotion or whatever it is so you just stand back and this is another similar to what also you were saying about watching the feeling yeah you're standing back and just watching what is happening here uh, and as you watch what is happening uh, it gradually because you're not adding any fuel to the fire it gradually shrinks and disappears as a consequence uh, yeah because uh, uh, it is the active continuation of thinking that is the problem but once your mindfulness is strong you're not activating that anymore and then it actually calms down all by itself this is using mindfulness to calm down the thought uh, that is what actually is happening here uh, and you're calming down the sankhara the creative force that is behind this uh, this is kind of the purpose purpose here uh. Yeah, sometimes you can do that, uh, and uh, so watching the feeling, as you say, is pretty much exactly what this is about. Because the moment your mindfulness arises, the thought is already kind of disappearing, and all that is left is the remnant from that thought, and that is like the feeling. And then you watch it all calm down, calm down, calm down, and eventually you can go down to the breath again. Uh. So here is the simile in this case, uh, just as a man walking fast might consider why am I walking fast? Uh, what if I walk slowly? Uh, and he would walk slowly. Then he might consider, why am I walking slowly? What if I stand? And he would stand. Then he might consider, why am I standing? What if I sit? He's a real lazy fellow. <laughs> <coughs> and he would sit. Then he might consider, why am I sitting? What if I lie down? And he would lie down. Yeah, so he's gradually calming down the activity, yeah? The sankhara is getting weaker and weaker and weaker. This is kind of the point here. Remember, a translation for sankhara is activity, yeah? And as you are mindful, that is exactly what is happening. Because mindfulness is the opposite, really. You're kind of just watching, you're not engaging, you're not c uh, doing anything anymore. So all that activity of the mind comes down, comes down, comes down, uh, yeah? And it's almost what we're trying to do at the beginning of every meditation, to allow this process of mindfulness, to allow everything to become peaceful and calm. And here you're using it deliberately if there is a disturbance. Uh, just watching, and then it goes eventually. Uh, it may take a little bit of time, but eventually it goes, uh, yeah? And then it disappears, and then you carry on with your meditation object. Uh, and then you enter the samadhi as a consequence. Uh. But again, no, this is the fourth way of dealing with this. Yeah, it is a. It comes kind of long way down the track. Yeah, so uh, remember again the order of things here. Yeah, and uh, the idea, ideally, especially if it is a strong thought, that the first techniques are going to be very powerful in, in obliterating these things. Uh, this might work if it is a very weak thought. Maybe your meditation is going really, really well. Otherwise, it can be. It can be difficult. Uh, you can try and uh, use them, but uh, remember the sequence here regardless, because that is an important sequence that you see. Everything in the suttas is uh, built up, uh, it has a structure, there's a reason why one com comes first uh, and something else comes last. Uh. And then uh, you go again, you go into the jhanas when eventually this calms down and you, uh, you develop this higher mind ultimately here. Uh, that is the fourth technique. Now we come to the last one. Here. And it is as follows. If while he is giving attention to the stilling of the thought formation of those thoughts, the still arise in him bad, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, with ill will and with confusion, then with his teeth clenched uh, and his tongue pressed against the roof of his mouth, uh, he should beat down, constrain and crush mind <laughs> with mind. <Ooh. laughs> when uh, with his teeth clenched and his tongue pressed against the roof of his mouth, he beats down, constrains and crushes mind with mind, uh, then any bad, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, with ill will and confusion are abandoned in him and subside. So uh, 
This is only to be done in very desperate situations, uh, not really recommended. Uh, that's why it is the last one. Yeah, you will notice here the last one. And this is where you are using brute force and brute willpower to constrain your mind in this way. Uh, and it is interesting because this particular way of practice elsewhere in the suttas uh, is called one of the ascetic practices, uh, where ascetics actually practice it in this way and it's considered wrong view. So elsewhere this practice is considered wrong view, whereas here it is actually incorporated as part of the Buddhist path. So how can you have it both ways? And the answer is that it is wrong view if you use it as an exclusive way of practice. Yeah? The Buddha used this practice himself before he became enlightened, he crushed mind with mind, and he realized there was no solution. Yeah? It didn't really get you anywhere. Yeah? Uh, so as an exercise in its own right, it doesn't work. In that sense, it is wrong view. But when you take it as a very small part of your practice that you use under exceptional circumstances, uh, if things get really out of hand, then it can be used occasionally. Uh, so if it's part of a whole path, then it may be useful, but it's not a path in its own right. And that is what it means, that it was wrong view to practice like that before his awakening. Uh, so. When should we use this kind of technique? And I would probably almost never use this kind of thing because it is really, uh, it is, um, you know, I mean, unless you are, something is really kind of bothering you for a long period of time, you can't get rid of it, uh, and you can maybe try it very gently to <coughs> do that, but it can lead to very bad consequences if we repress and suppress thoughts. And uh, ask a psychologist and will tell you that this is one of the things that lead to mental instability in people. For example, you have ill will and you really don't want, you know, it, it's not socially acceptable to have too much ill will. People are not going to like you, it's going to be problematic. So sometimes people repress that inside of themselves. Uh, and sometimes that repression can lead to really bad psychological side effects. Uh, very common thing, I think, everywhere in the world uh, that this is a consequence of repression. So people who have a tendency to this should absolutely not do it. Uh, people who have a better mind state, they can maybe use it occasionally. Uh, so be, uh, so this here you have to be very careful with what you are doing. One of the problems is that very often in life this is the first method we use, uh, yeah? Because you are kind of in a difficult situation and you have to, you can't really lose face and you have to show your good side and you can't be angry or whatever, so you kind of try to suppress your mind a little bit. Uh, but actually, in the Dhamma, it is the last method that we should use, uh, not the first one. Uh, we tend to reach for willpower straight away, because that is what we know. Uh, willpower is what we always use to get anything in life, most people, uh, yeah, to do your assignments or to do your job or to do whatever it is. We use willpower to enable us to sustain the attention on what we're doing. Uh, so willpower is like the first place we go to normally. Uh, but actually here it is the last place, uh, the very last thing you should use. Uh, and uh, then maybe it is acceptable, but it's the one to be very careful with, I think. Uh, and then, if you're able to use that technique appropriately, actually then too, you then gain the samadhi as a consequence. It says there. So, let us come to the very last paragraph of this sutta. And uh, the Buddha says, when bhikkhus, when a bhikkhu is giving attention to some sign, page 52, <coughs> and owing to that sign there arise in him bad, unwholesome thoughts uh, connected with desire, with ill will and delusion. Uh, then when he gives attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome, they are abandoned and subside. Uh, yeah? But if that doesn't work, uh, uh, then he examines the danger in those thoughts. Uh, if that doesn't work, uh, he tries to forget those thoughts, to not pay attention to them. If that does not work, uh, uh, he gives uh, attention to the stilling of the thought activity, yeah, the, the um, thought intention, if you like, yeah, behind those thoughts. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then uh, with his teeth clenched uh, and his tongue pressed against the roof of his mouth, you beat down, constrain and crush his mind with mind. Uh, and then those unwholesome thoughts are abandoned in him. Uh, 
and his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. Uh, you attain the jhanas, basically samadhi, on this basis. Uh, it's again the gradual movement away from the unwholesome, more refined unwholesome, then the wholesome thoughts and then the jhanas. It's important to get that sequence right. Uh, that sequence is fundamental. Uh, and then uh, if uh, it says here, this bhikkhu is then called a master of the courses of thought. Uh, he will think whatever thoughts he wishes to think, uh, and he will not think any thoughts he does not wish to think. Uh, isn't that nice? Uh, full control of your own mind. You can choose whatever thoughts you want to, cho want to think. How often is it that we have thoughts we don't really want to think? Quite common, isn't it? Uh, the mind, we think that we, our mind is out of control, but it is not so much that the mind is out of control. Actually, we want to think those thoughts somewhere. We are encouraging them, but it seems like they're just coming out of nowhere. And the reason we want to think them is just because of habits, really. Yeah, we have been thinking like this before, and now we're thinking in the same way again. Often habits that are very, very deep-seated. Yeah, so. But actually, it is possible to deal with this in a way whereby you only think thoughts that you want to, thought, want to think. Yeah. I'm not there yet, I don't know how, I, I find this quite hard to believe myself sometimes, but I can see how it's leading in that direction, yeah? I can see how it is going in that way. Yeah. But sometimes it's hard to avoid thinking thoughts that are not right sometimes. Yeah. So you just have to lean in that direction. Keep doing it, yeah, again and again and again. Uh, and one day you will be master of your thoughts, uh, and all you will have all the time loving kindness, compassion, equanimity, mudita. That is all your mind will be filled with. Uh. Doesn't that sound nice? Yeah, this is kind of one of the advantages of practicing this path. All you have is this beautiful mind state, and when you see someone like that, it's like seeing Ajahn Ganha, yeah, with this kind of bright expression in his face, always bright, always kind, yeah? And then when he, so it, it's kind of, it's very attractive as well, you make many friends that way, right? That's kind of, I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing, but you do anyway. So if you like that, then it's, uh, it's going to happen. Huh? And then comes the very last part there. He has severed craving, flung off the fetters, uh, and with a complete penetration of conceit has made an end of suffering. Yeah? And as someone has pointed out, it looks a bit like it's added to the end. It doesn't really fit the conclusion that you have mastery of thought. That kind of makes good sense. Uh, but suddenly it adds this at the end, as if he has come to the end of the path without anything more to do. Uh, and uh, the, uh, if you look at that sutta in a comparative perspective, you compare it to the Chinese translation of the same sutta from the Sarvastivadan school, it doesn't have, doesn't have that last sen sentence. Uh, so that last sentence quite likely has been somehow added, maybe from a commentary or something, to the Pali in the course of oral history, and doesn't really belong to that su this particular sutta in this place. Uh, probably been kind of come in from the commentary somehow, it has kind of uh, contaminated the sutta a little bit. Uh, nobody probably on purpose, just this is how oral transmission happened, contamination happens, uh, uh, but probably doesn't actually belong there. It stops with the idea of being a mastery of thought. Uh, that's kind of good enough, isn't it, uh, for one sutta? You don't need to take it all the way to enlightenment. Uh, that is what the Blessed One said. Uh, the bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So, uh, there you are. That is the um, how to deal with the, the thinking mind in quite a bit of detail. I hope these methods make some sense to you. I'm going to look at the first two methods, the idea of uh, substituting thoughts and of, of uh, <coughs> thinking about the bad consequence of thoughts. I'm going to think look about that quite a bit more, because that is such an important part of this, how to actually do this in practice. Uh, and I'm going to look specifically a lot at uh, how to overcome ill will, one session on that, uh, and then also one session later on on how to overcome sensuality, because these are obviously critical factors uh, uh, on this particular path. Uh, but uh, let's have another break, uh, and let's uh, come back again at four o'clock. Uh.